I don't know, Charles. Ah! I don't think it'll work, Charles. It will work! No! It will work! What one man can do, another can do. You can't kill the bear, Charles. He's ahead of us all the time. It's like he's reading our minds. He's stalking us, for God's sakes! He... I'm not gonna die. No, I'm gonna kill the bear. Say it, I'm gonna kill the bear. Say it. I'm gonna kill the bear. Say it! I'm gonna kill the bear. Say it again! I'm gonna kill the bear. And again! I'm gonna kill the bear! Good! What one man can do, another can do. What one man can do, another can do. Say it again! What one man can do, another can do. Say it again! What one man can do, another can do! Yeah! You're goddamn right. It's today. I'm gonna kill the motherfucker. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the wildest edition of Nick's Nonfiction. There is, you're here with your host, Nick Munez. Today we have got a fellow Spaniard, Lawrence Gonzalez, with his book, Deep Survival. Lawrence wasn't told the usual stories growing up of Icarus flying too close to the sun. Senor Gonzalez, his dad, told him stories of the World War II flak battalion he was in. 88 millimeter rounds being fired at the boys 27,000 feet in the sky. These real life stories, sometimes they're less believable than a Greek myth. Hermes, get the fuck out of here. We've got men surviving five mile falls out of the sky. This is extreme survival today. And these stories, we got seven chapters, they are better than the most perfectly crafted seven archetypes. How do you track Will Smith in the woods? You use fresh prints. <laughs> Lawrence, he said his dad, he was shot down over the English Channel. True story, 90% of the crew dead on impact. He said as the plane tumbled nose over tail, his vision turned into a nasty soup of unfamiliar colors. All the lights and warning horns were going off. There was no time to hear himself think. A minute must have passed. This guy was in free fall. He finally remembers there's a parachute underneath his seat, grabs it, throws it on, jumps out with 400 feet of airtime left, watches all of his buddies burn in a fire, fiery explosion, and then he got caught in a canopy of trees. This is unbelievable. The most eventful 30 seconds of your life. And then a French lady cut him down and made croissants. You're not going to hear that from Odysseus, what that guy slayed a cyclops. And then had to sail another 40 years until he found a chick. <laughs> Lawrence Gonzalez's dad doing some real survival. I was doing my own survival challenge recently where I forgot toilet paper. I wound up taking a leaf out of Bear Grylls' book. <laughs> On fire. The first half of this book, it's all unbelievable stories. Second half explains why people survive who dies our previous survival show was like ernest shackleton that guy motivated men to stay alive for an iceberg on two years and running and they were running on their own feces they did jank them all day to get high never get high on your own supply adaptability is what counts <laughs> one of my favorite bumper stickers you see out here it's not about the altitude man it's about the attitude even when you're in the face of death, you got to start dancing, baby. <laughs> Gonzalez, this one isn't going to fit on a bumper sticker. The maddening thing for someone with a Western scientific turn of mind is that it's not what's in your pack that separates the quick from the dead. It's not even in your mind. Corny as it sounds, it's what's in your heart. I'm looking for something sentimental. <laughs> That's going to have to do. All right, so we got a fun show today. Check out Perry Schwunt, Perry Harry Schwunt on Instagram, patreon.com slash the niche. Here's some memes. Civilizations built in the mountains. Be like, you didn't have to cut me
其独特的基本功。你供我要害。About the author Lawrence Gonzalez. Patreon, definitely. I gotta plug this again. We've got Hatchet, the book in video form. I'm making fire with flint rods, high altitude hikes, memes over at Harry Schwant. I'm gonna start making NFF, NNF, NFTs, baby. <laughs> I'm gonna sell a gif of my Gucci hair. It's gonna be worth thousands. 1947. Lawrence Gonzalez was born in St. Louis, Missouri. He grew up in Houston and then attended the management school at MIT. Something you probably never knew about the St. Louis Arch. It is a weather control tool. It's the highest freestanding arch in the world. You're gonna have to research that one for yourself. Or keep tuning in to our monthly Patreon episodes where we go deep, deeper than survival. Deep survival: Who lives, who dies, and why. This is his biggest selling book. It's a sequel to Surviving Survival. <laughs> This redundant motherfucker. Who can drink an entire gallon of gasoline and survive another day? Jerry can. Yeah, that was not really funny. Jerry can jokes. We're doing limited topics of survival. This guy, he won magazine awards. He's got a couple lesser-known books. One about a plane crash in Iowa. He's done conferences with Navy SEALs, NFL players, Citibank, Exxon. He's teaching Water Street Capital how to survive in the woods. Why? He does like motivational speaking. So there's definitely a self-development aspect to take away today. I don't know if it was Rex Tillerson who said this one. To survive is to procrastinate death, but in the end, there is always a deadline. <coughs> CEO humor. Two of my mom's sisters moved to the Alaskan wilderness. Now it's a double aunt tundra. <laughs> Guys are a little too kind to me. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll start the show in a minute after another ad. We'll be right back. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Lawrence Gonzalez, Deep Survival, Chapter One. Look out! Here comes Ray Charles. Lawrence starts. If you could see adrenaline, then you'd see a green, greasy river oozing off of the beach of San Diego tonight. He's at a military exercise. You got landing signal officers. They're guiding in ships over. Eight foot waves. He's watching F-18s land on aircraft carriers. Aren't these guys shitting their pants? There's adrenaline everywhere. He's watching from afar. Lawrence says the pilot's performance was a perfect act of survival. There he was, safe on the deck of a big boat. He climbed into a machine full of explosive fuel and had himself shot off into the night with a nuclear steam cat. This guy, very descriptive. It's a fun read. Fun to bring out into the woods. In a truly life and death situation, the survival brain takes over, is what he's getting at here. And the stories will get much spookier. What good is it to have, you know, a gun protecting your house if you freeze up in the times of whatever? All of this military training is just to get you so you don't crumble under pressure. Easy example off the bat: when you walk into a gun store, that's why I'm using it. You turn onto a higher functioning brain. You're all silly. Oh, I'm gonna go fire some firearms, and then you hear the first bang. You feel the real coil in your wrist, and you're in a dangerous situation. That higher brain flips on, and there's a lot of activities like this. Imagine what Lawrence feels like being dropped in the middle of a war exercise. Lawrence finishes this point. Big quote. Then, using only his skills and his superior emotional control, the pilot bought himself back by the remarkable performance of catching a wire that he could not see with a hook that he could not see as well, using cues that made no natural sense while going 150 miles an hour in the black ass night. Black ass night. He's、uh, <laughs> listening to jazz in that pilot seat. There's no highway to the danger zone. Posits his first thesis here. 
most of us will never be in a true survival jam. So keep teaching those CEOs. But every situation begins with the same essence. You must remain calm. So this is relevant for CEOs. You make it a big deal, you got to remain calm. And uh, for this, uh, we got to use the intro to this video in the edge whatever that video is with <laughs> Hannibal Lecter and the actor who shot somebody they go into the woods together and have to survive one's a billionaire and who do you think survives the ones who can remain calm Lawrence actually mentioned jazz he's going it became bigger than bebop because black musicians remained cool in the face of racism <laughs> all right he's paying the piper's toll to the whatever woke crowd here yeah, or maybe beatbox sucks and jazz is actually good music. Lollipop, lollipop. Oh, what the fuck was beatbox? People from the 30s to the 50s, <laughs> they were all deranged. Most people can't, like, turn their fear into focus. That's some high level Jedi mind trick. You got to become an alchemist. Lawrence interviewed one of the F 18 pilots who said he loves the pressure. To him, it's like World War III meets the Olympics. <laughs> um, you know, kind of like Event 201, where all the world's leaders simulated a pandemic outbreak in 2019. There's another name for these people who are unflusterable. You could call them a CEO, you could call them a pilot. They are psychopaths. <laughs> you have to have a lower. Uh, baseline of emotion and again psychology whatever you want to put labels on people you can handle pressure or you're psychotic i think it's just a lost skill to remain still you know when you see a bear they try to tell you to <laughs> lay down in the fetal position i think i'm gonna keep the firearm on my hip most people would get scared and scream and then the bear would come and eat them I don't know. I'm trying to run. <laughs> it's a lost skill. Sometimes remaining uh, in the freezing is the right thing to do. He interviewed an NBA shooting guard. Wrapping up the chapter here. He's going, how do you focus when there's 40,000 fans yelling at you? He's going, everything melts away when you're in the moment. You gotta, yeah, just fucking flow at it, bruh. Following up this with a Greek classical quote, Plato understood that emotions could trump reason and that to succeed we have to use the reins of reason on the horse of emotion. Got some better quotes here. There was a 1910 explorer. This guy was doing a South Pole mission. He lost his partner. He said he displayed the quality that is perhaps only one which may be said with certainty, self-control. <laughs> a lot of preamble for no payoff there. Yeah, have some self-control. Use the reins of emotion on your horse. I don't know. Good final point we got here by a pilot. We make a grim coarse jests about it. When a man dies, there we say he has nipped off his final turd. <laughs> and so we speak of everything that keeps us from going mad. As long as we take it that way, we maintain our own resistance. You gotta be like a jazz musician and joke about the racist idiots, because otherwise the death is going to fester in your mind. That was a terrible name for a chapter. What was it called? Look out, here comes Ray Charles. He didn't even mention it. We're talking about jazz barely. I do know a pilot who is also a jazz musician, so I guess it all checks out. Chapter 2, Memories of the Future. Jumping into the action here. We got a group of 20 snowmobilers, quote, they had just completed a search and rescue mission to bring out three others whose engine had trouble and become stranded overnight at Middle Kootenai Pass in Alberta, Canada. By the grace of God, these guys find the three other men who uh, were stuck in the middle of nowhere. They start <laughs> their way home. There's 17 total men, and the leaders split off with the people they're being rescued. So there's... About ten other guys, they're lollygagging on the way home. Lollipop. They were doing this thing called hammerheading. It's a backcountry game. It's also called high marking. You gotta gun your snowmobile up a straightaway and see who can travel up the slope of a mountain the highest before gravity stops you and you can't go any further. Lawrence said, 
the official report would eventually remind us that they had all been specifically told that there was a high avalanche danger and the high marking of hammerheading was out of the question that day. <laughs> There's no, uh, these guys aren't following protocol. Psychologists call it a propensity towards sensation seeking. People have like an impulse to use the equipment. If you put a shotgun in someone's hand, you want to feel the power impulse towards whatever no i call it the shotgun complex the first time you picked up the toy axe you know as a kid you would like chase your siblings around the house where's mommy here's johnny it's fun to use things for what they're not intended for <laughs> all those tiktoks are about guys with cranes using them to jump into lakes <laughs> the propensity towards sensation seeking there were five inches of loose snow on top of the snowpack they were hammerheading. Another quote here, the whole system was angled downward at about 35 degrees, which happens to be the critical angle at which most avalanches occur. On steeper slopes, the snow tends to slide off it before it can consolidate into a slab. On shallower ones, it remains fairly stable. 35 degrees is the death angle, apparently. One man, he's racing up to do the high mark. He slows down, and his tail starts digging in. He's stuck vertically. A second guy, not knowing what to do, guns it up there to try and help him. And this is when it clicked. <laughs> you know, there's an avalanche warning today. Goes against his rational brain. He's full impulse right now. Another human needed help. So maybe he's not a total douche. According to the official report, at about 11.40... Snowmobiler 2 also sped up the slope, and when he was about two-thirds of the way up, a size 3 avalanche released. Snowmobiler 2 was able to ride out on the side of the avalanche and escape James Bond. At the bottom of the slope, the other had been seen the avalanche and managed to ride out of the path, but there was one down there who just froze. Good language there from the official report. At least those forest rangers have a sense of humor. This guy froze figuratively and literally under an avalanche. Not including the actual report, there was that second guy who got stuck up at the top and tumbled all the way down it in a size 3. Just bad idea after bad idea here. Got some more specs. The avalanche released a 450-foot wide swath of snow, 32 inches thick, all the way from the top of the ridge. Once it started, it rushed down 400 yards, cascading on those ball-bearing grains like eight lanes of concrete interstate highway, sloughing into an old-fashioned San Francisco earthquake. That was probably sloshing. One guy froze, one guy got hit by an interstate of traffic. <laughs> he just froze. <laughs> Uh, man, dude, that's a wah, wah, a train coming at you. That's fucking John Cena in the ring coming at you. That's China coming at America. Seven. <laughs> Damn, dude. He, they said the first guy was stuck under nine feet of snow. The second guy who, that was the one who tumbled. And then the one who froze, he got pinned up against his uh, snowmobile and his hand broke in a weird position. That's pretty lucky. He described the experience as being encased in wet concrete. Absolute nightmare. What would you do? Hopefully you have a lighter in your pocket, you rip a fart and start Dutch ovening yourself <laughs> out of there. Wind up cooking yourself. He rescued all the... Has nobody ever done that? That's got to be highest viewed video on YouTube. I just turned my channel into farting underneath covers and lighting. <laughs> That's what this show is going to turn into. He, they rescued all the guys by 1150. They had walkie-talkies that made it possible. There was a third guy, uh, yeah, who was mildly hurt. <laughs> what a rush. Avalanche humor. It was completely avoidable. These guys should have just completed their mission and went home. Lawrence continues with some analyzation. The act of riding a snowmobile up a steep hill had come to elicit an emotional response. Those riders had done it before and had been rewarded with a good feeling. It was a physical feeling, and the body liked it, so it was bookmarked, so to speak. He talks about this phrase a lot, bookmarking. I think they call it somatic markers in psychology. It's how your brain loves impulses and you start seeking things out. The more you feed into things, 
you could let this take advantage of you and become an adrenaline junkie or you could like um I don't know, there's worse things you could be addicted to. Pill popping. Even uh, if it's a placebo, a booster, you get a somatic marker for that. He had a great premise here. Imagine what eating would be like if done purely by the deductive process. Well, pizza isn't good for me. Logically, I will never eat it again. <laughs> the older I get, the more fucking Spock-like I become like this, unfortunately. I'm eating cashews and mozzarella every night. <laughs> What was this point about? He says, the most remarkably discovering modern neuroscience, <laughs> that's a direct quote, is the body controls the brain as much as the brain controls the body. So as much as you feed into your somatic markers that your body likes, your brain is going to get accustomed to it. He weaved in the chapter name here, your body's impulses push you toward the future that it is comfortable with. That's why it's called Memories of the Future, where you could, yeah, we're going to get freaking Freudian. Bookmark your own somatic markers. One day you could uh, learn to remain calm in the face of an avalanche, but don't freeze up. Chapter 3, A Map of the World. On September 6, 1997, James Gabba, an army ranger, was taking a guided commercial rafting trip down the upper Guali River in West Virginia. Then his raft hit a rock. He's a 36-year-old captain. Gabba, he's thrown overboard. He didn't perceive himself being in any real danger, so he's swimming next to the raft. There's a big rock coming up in the center of the river. James wants to explore it gets sucked underneath the rock and pinned in a current and drowns. The official report read, The guest clearly did not take the situation seriously, but that's not true. He took it very seriously. In Lawrence's words, this guy took a calculated risk. So that's a serious risk assessment. He went on to explain how T-cells work. And I'm not trying to bore anybody here. He came to the conclusion, in that and other ways, the immune system continuously rearranges the organism's relationship to its environment. That's fucking adaptation. Adaptation. Bear grills. Improvise. Adapt. Overcome. I don't know if Lawrence was protecting the name of the victim here. I'm becoming an English teacher. <laughs> The name of the captain was GABA. That's also a neurotransmitter, and it reduces your excitability. A lot of people take it when they also take psychedelics. It reduces the blood-brain ba barrier. So you could take it for alcohol and get super fucked up. Like, uh, take it when you need to chill as well. It's in fish and vegetables. You could just take concentrated forms. Captain GABA here. Imagine this whole book is fictitious. <laughs> He uh, was on his boat like a normal tourist, and he really wasn't excitable. So he jumped in the water, or he got overthrown. Whatever, man. Shouldn't there have been a goddamn sign in the river? Hey, there's a fucking vortex under this rock. <laughs> Warning. He, If he lived, he could have sued the resort for not marking this off. You know, <laughs> they're trying to bury the whole story here by saying in the official report this guy wasn't taking the trip seriously he's an army ranger there was an unforeseeable maelstrom gava <laughs> i don't know man the whole bottom line here i think is you can't say that you own the river you know why do i have to wait 15 years to float down the colorado river there's a waiting list the parks and rec needs to they're protecting their ass from lawsuits, it seems like. Just stop saying you own the fucking thing. <laughs> the Rio Grande. Yeah, that's ours. We have to protect you. What the heck? You're not allowed to take a risk. <laughs> You're not allowed to make somatic markers. What was the point? A map of the world. Lawrence said, Scientists, with their ever-playful juggling of three or four languages at once call that long-term potential so risk is an integral part of life and learning a baby who doesn't walk for example will never risk falling but exchange for falling he gains the much greater survival advantage of being bipedal hands-free baby i love being a human it's a baller move i walk through the zoo and i flip off all the animals it's pretty badass man we're the only people that could do it 
learning how to ski is worth the risk. Like uh, out here in Colorado, it's what everybody's obsessed with. They're trying to blame all of the uh, <laughs> the ski lift shortages on lack of working. Well, maybe because no one can afford to live in a Vail on the uh, fucking salary. Oh, live in your car. No, thank you. Everybody <laughs> and their mother literally is skiing out here in Colorado. And, you know, it's calculated risk. The older you get, the fall is much more costly. Old people on the slopes are alive and electric. For a lot of people, risk is worth reward. D it decreases with age, I'm saying. Or no doubt hitting critical mass. No mass village. High risk tolerance. Some people are fun to be around. Like, <laughs> these old people who are skiing, they probably go to the Winter Park Casino at night as well. And the alternative, you go <laughs> up the lift with people. Can you please wear your mask on the chairlift? Yeah, have fun on the bunny hill, asshole. No risk. <laughs> this job, you get the point. This chapter was called The Map of the World. Another fucking artsy Ray Charles title about mapping your own risk tolerance. <laughs> Lawrence quote. The Canadian snowmobilers suffered a similar consequence stemming from emotional bookmarkers. Unfortunately, it found nothing in the atlas of experience. His emotional map of the world contained no feelings about avalanches because his body had no experience of them. How would you know to be afraid of the thing if you've never seen one? Unexperienced is not taking something serious. This captain who was just swimming around his raft and knew how to swim. But yeah, take your thing seriously, map your world. Did you hear the one about the summit summit? All of the world's natural disasters met to decide which one was the worst. Avalanche won by a landslide. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to chapter four, a gorilla in our mindset. If this chapter <laughs> doesn't have a fucking gorilla... And missed, I'm going to burn this book. It better have Ray Charles in it, too. Still waiting. The Illinois River in southwest Oregon has 35 miles of class 3 to 4 rapids in a class 5 moss-covered gorge in the middle, which a section is known as the Green Wall. This fella Gary Huff was a minister. He took a group of kids out onto the river for a weekend first day of the trip they experienced a rain so the cubic flow of the river is mad high yo more hazards huff has the first three groups set up camp for the night the environment's changing rapidly his somatic markers are going wild lords he's talking about the rain record for this day in 1998 was a record three inches of rainfall fell <laughs> repetitive gonzalez Melting snow in the Sisikiu Mountains, adding even more water to the flow. The river rose 15 feet, and the flow reached 13,500 cubic feet per second. This is not ideal for the church boys, Minister Huff. This guy hears a uh, hiss in the distance on night two. So he thinks he's a snake in the trees behind him. It's the <laughs> trying to eat an apple, Mr. Minister. When the first... Fucking, it all goes quiet. There's dead wind. He's going, this is not a normal thing. Like, if you spend time outside, you can hear a camper four miles away whispering if there is nothing happening in the air. And so he hears what's like a train in the distance. The more you read these stories, there's like pressure differences when you're in certain ridges and long rivers. These people are super attuned to it. Or maybe this guy was imbued with Jesus's might while protecting these children <laughs> huff he brush it, brushes his off he's thinking it's nothing when the next morning there's a thunderstorm with fucking freight train lightning his sixth sense was right Lawrence is saying so a survivor expects the world to keep changing and keeps his senses always tuned into what's up the survivor is continuously adapting the minister's mistake was that he wrote it off you should never write things off. Everything has something you could learn from it. Like sensitivity is the key out here. This man's a tuning fork. One of the older kids was rafting, and he said, The river had become up a foot an hour 
for this second day they decide to raft anyway. It's gone from clear to chocolate milk. When there are no more eddies and there are 18-inch diameter trees going down at 15 miles an hour, it's just a tough decision. <laughs> really shouldn't be. So they're floating down next to gigantic trees in a river of chocolate milk called Willy Wonka. You're going to have to, like, batten down the hatches. And, of course, they keep on floating because they see experienced kayakers go down. <laughs> These kids are on a raft. Good thing Huff is right with the Lord. He says a couple Hail Marys in this long-ass quote. The first group was eaten by a 15-foot wave. <laughs> what the heck? A standing wave portaging at the green wall. That scary part with all the moss, nothing to hold on to. You're reaching up for your life, and the sirens of the moss are pulling you down. Yeah, we're going to start getting creepy on the show. It's 10 a.m., and Huff is watching these kids drown. <laughs> Two paddlers were eaten near the little green wall, another hellacious section. Great language. They were still operating on a modal of the environment. <laughs> modal, model, modem. The results were fatal. One member of each party drowned, and the others lost all their equipment and had to be rescued. One survivor carried five miles downstream before he was able to get out. You know, they had to call, like, an airlift, six bodies. It's fucking disgusting, the aftermath here. <laughs> but the minister wrecked these kids. Lawrence, he was rationalizing the change of plans. Like, why did this guy... They could have walked back the first day of floating. And they went twice as far in a giant storm. Maybe that uh, low hum of the storm eroded the guy's logic. It's kind of scary, bro. They say uh, Winnipeg, it might be Canada. There's a town that has a low-frequency hum, and it makes people go crazy. They think it might be from, like, a metal factory that's across, across one of the Great Lakes, and it's the way the hum gets to it. Like, that's kind of the pseudoscience side, but we're going deep survival here, baby. This guy made a bad decision, <laughs> or maybe it was the hum of the woods. You cannot be too influenced by new information. Lawrence is trying to say you also cannot be shut off from new information. Volition, baby. Somewhere in between, you got to be in tune with the adrenaline and your instincts. He's going to fucking have a plan. <laughs> Logically formulate a set of action you're going to take so that you don't wander into the chocolate river. We talked about the implicit bias. We all want to change our minds and we feel stupid when we didn't change our minds. You know, it feels good. I have a new plan. But a lot of times it's better to stick to what you know. Bigger quote here towards the end of the chapter. And it's kind of easing us into part two of the book. In more subtle tricks, the magician creates a mental mode model modem a short-term memory of the world. You see the cards, right? This is what the cards look like. Every model of the world comes with its own underlying assumptions based on experience, memories, secondary emotions, and emotional bookmarks, all of which influence what we expect to happen and what we plan to do about it. Uh, magic. We're going to read some books on that, too, and go really deep. You have to prime somebody's impulses to be able to fool them. Problem, reaction, solution. It's like, I don't know, man, the brain fucking rules. Use it. <laughs> Set up your markers. Don't get played out there. It's no, there's no one, no sirens really in the woods that are going to try to lure you in deep. It's a lot to learn. We're fucking primates. And yeah, that chapter was about the mist of the green wall. <laughs> You get to pass this around, Gonzo. Chapter 5, Bending the Map. Got a lot of accidents so far. Now we're focusing on why people survive. This one <laughs> starts in Rocky Mountain National, my friggin' backyard. Get some water. Long quote. When Ken Killip sent out on the trail at Milner Pass in Rocky Mountain National... 
at dawn. It was August 8th, 1998. He had the nagging sense that he should not have come. A group of firefighter friends had planned the three-day backcountry hiking and fishing trip, but the others had gradually dropped out until Killip and his friend John York were the only ones left. They're doing a small section of the Continental Divide Trail. It's near Mount Ida. Lawrence says, Mount Ina. While six million miles, that's not right, while six miles doesn't sound like much, hiking with a full pack to nearly 13,000 feet is serious business. In addition, Rock Lake sits at the edge of Forest Canyon, a densely wooded wilderness in the Big Thompson River Valley, and the local district ranger would later say it's one of the most remote areas in the park. It's pretty unforgiving. All those places will uh, come back up. We got fucking footage of this on the Patreon as well. If you need a reference, both Ken and John had military survival training. They uh, were well adapted. They were serious in uh, Gonzo's point of view. Killip was the slower of the two. So rather than adjusting their pace to the slower, as even wolves understand you got to do for the pack, Ken decides to try and keep his mouth shut and push faster than he's capable quote here they'd begun on a trail but beyond the top of mount ida it was a trail trailless wilderness where you need both a map and compass now as he watched york disappeared into the approaching wilderness killip didn't comprehend the insidious process that was taking place ken said he had his mental map and the area all in his head it's all from my prior topographical research i know this What he couldn't plan for was being inside of a passing cloud. You cannot rely on a meteorologist when you're going into the tundra, B. It's fucking terrifying being inside of the mist. You can't see more than 20 yards. It's pure instinct at that point. Got a quote. Not to mention here, (laughs) Lord's... Probably would have made your book more interesting. Mount Ida is known for its afternoon lightning strikes. (laughs) I don't know if the fire gang should have knew this. York, he was a quarter mile ahead. And then uh, Ken in the back, he saw a passing group of hikers. And he was like, did you see anybody up there? They all said, yes, you might want to turn around because of the weather. Ken decides to push through anyway. I can make it the quarter mile through nothingness. (laughs) <laughs> you always know, see there's one decision that's like, what the fuck are you thinking in all these stories? The multiple stresses of weather, fatigue, attitude, dehydration, and anxiety were closing in on Killip's ability to find the vital bases between useful emotion and reason. <laughs> you do get super dehydrated up there, too, because it's cold out. You just think you're okay. You're turning into jerky. Killip, he was in panic mode, he admitted. The hikers came from the opposite direction, Lawrence said. The perception that he was climbing Mount Ida gave a more settled feeling to the area of his brain that was trying to create a mental map. At least the hippocampus had something to work with. Killip could picture Mount Ida and its relationship to his destination and mental maps and images. Without images, we are lost. When Killip struggled to the top, he turned east and began the descent into the drainage following his image of where Rock Lake should be, but he immediately knew that something was wrong. There was unpleasant jolt from the amygdala. This was not the place, the river, the little lakes. He knew that he was in the wrong place. It winds up finding out later on. He's like within a quarter mile of Rock Lake. He was never that far off. I'm saying with the fog... It's uh, pretty demoralizing. So he spends a night outside here. (laughs) He wakes up the next morning with welts on his body. He collapsed out of exhaustion. Ken Killip, he's saying, what the hell happened? It hailed that night. (laughs) And he slept outside under the freezing nothingness. Are you kidding me, man? This guy shouldn't be alive. He's fucking, remember that show on TV, I'm Lucky to Be Alive? (laughs) That's what spurred my obsession with death, I feel like. I told my story, I had a close navigational call on the St. Vrain Trail that's literally 10 miles south of where he's talking about in this story. Uh, It's in the Bushcraft 101 book, I won't tell it again. But you do have that amygdala zap. 
I told, I, I shit. I dug a tiny hole and I pooped just to get that off my mind. I was like, this is serious now. So I made a poop joke. <laughs> Actually happened. There really is a flip in your brain when it goes to a serious moment. And uh, yeah, it's the Trail Ridge Road hike, I think. That's, you could see Mount Ida in the background and the whole valley this guy got lost in. <laughs> I saw an elk there. Stoats. Uh, another longer quote. Killheb, Killip had not, in fact, reached the summit of Mount Ida. He was looking down instead a pellet drainage about a mile north. Killip now teetered to the invisible divide. So these guys both went down opposite sides of the continental divide. <laughs> they had to rescue themselves. The common theme in all these stories, they never would have been found separately. And the another big part about this story, they didn't have to pay for search and rescue. <laughs> That's huge. Uh, hardest decision to make, you know, should I retrace my steps? Should I try to go with the model that I have in my head and try to find where my buddy is at? You have to like have pre approved meeting points in case something goes wrong. Better quote here. Psychologists who study the behavior of people who get lost report that very few ever backtrack. The guys who look forward into real or unimagined worlds. In Killip's case, there were more than other factors, too. He'd walked all day, exhausted, dehydrated, wet probably by now, feeling like a fool in York's eyes. York probably waited up there saying, where the hell is this guy? <laughs> He'd come up a very long way. His gut told him that it would be a very long and painful way back, which would lead to water. There's this mental block in backtracking. You want to keep him looking forward. The way I saved myself was going to a trail that I knew would intersect at some point <laughs> rather than blazing a new tra path into the wilderness <laughs> finding Rock Lake it's kind of same with the minister back there they could have just walked back backtracking is better but then again you're admitting you're a pussy you think you know where your plan is going to take you <laughs> the Woody Allen joke if you want to make God laugh tell him your plan <laughs> A laugh track is well deserved there. You know there's 600 sitcoms made a year? <laughs> <laughs> Big laugh. <laughs> Lawrence is talking about his uh, analyzation here. Decent quote. Until about half a century ago, there was a widespread belief among scientists that people had some sort of inherent sense of direction. The observation that certain people around the world were especially skilled at navigation, in the absence of obvious cues, was evidence of a magnetic sense. Evidence! You ever seen that thing? It might have been on the Discovery Channel. I watched Steve Irwin a lot as a kid. <laughs> They put aboriginals from Australia inside a box, a merry-go-round. They spun them around a million times, and these guys were still able to tell which direction was north. What? These motherfuckers are tuned into the magnetic poles. <laughs> Santa. Is, uh, like, our sense of direction seriously is innate. I don't know what this five senses bullshit is they teach you in schools. Now, sight, sound, touch. What about fucking horniness? I can sense people's stress and anxiety. What about me? I could sense single MILFs in the woods within a mile radius. <laughs> Australian the aboriginals like proves there's probably some evidence for other senses we have. <laughs> he quoted an old pioneer. Maybe Woody Allen plagiarized these guys. The quote goes, There's no such thing as being lost. You just started your next land survey. Sounds like a Twain quote. When Ken got lost on Mount Ida, his brain started a new map. Like at a certain point, you gotta fucking scrap the map in your head. <laughs> just start from scratch. The hippocampus doesn't have a goal. It's all in your root lizard brain that thinks you're moving towards the predetermined goal. You gotta just get your mind in check with your body. That quote from before, their uh, neuroscience says they affect each other. Syrotic was the name of this pioneer he was quoting. And this quote was fucking banger. 
Panic usually implies tearing around or thrashing, thrashing through the brush, but in the earlier stages, it's less frantic. It all starts when the look about and find that supposedly familiar location now appears totally strange. Or when they start to realize that it seems to be taking longer to reach a particular place than they had expected. There is a tendency to hurry to find the right place. Maybe it's just over that little ridge. It's scary. It's good to hear hear these stories then to experience it for the first time on yourself. Whew. I'm telling you, you got to have some sort of a base. There's also this study from Edmonton, a Canadian college. It doesn't translate to have city knowledge inside of a forest. Like all the rigid right angles you see of a road, you could bookmark, okay, I will turn when I see the advertisement of a hot lady. That's your bookmark, whatever he was fucking calling it. If you don't spend a lot of time in the bush, your brain is just flooded. It's overwhelmed with these hormones, he's saying. What did they call it? Lawrence said, if things get progressively more unfamiliar and mixed up, the victim may then develop a feeling of vertigo. The trees and slopes seep to close in. Claustrophobia happens, and you're running frantic like that old timer said. You're thrashing through the bush. Vertigo. All the new terms, whatever. I'm trying to find this other one he had. It's wild. Uh, 1700, this quote. People have known for ages that going from the protection of society into the wild can have a profound effect on the balance of reason and emotion. It can induce altered states of consciousness, hallucinations, even death. The word bewilderment, with its definite familiar Anglo-Saxon ring, dates from 1684 and comes from the archaic verb wilder. To wilder someone means to lead him into the woods and get him lost. Whoa. A lot of history to the word fucking bewilderment and all that. There really is an altered state of consciousness people felt when they went out into the woods. <laughs> And, like, we learned Scarlet Letter, the woods is a place to go be a heretic where people went to have gay sex and not be cast out of the church or whatever. You could take a man into the woods like a gangster and get him lost, bewilder someone's ass. <laughs> There's all these terms for it throughout time. Vertigo, fucking whatever. <laughs> the woods are magic. Emergency loss of control you go through. The arrested development, for all intents and purposes, Ken can give it fucking as many turns of phrases as he wants. He's got a quote here to wrap up that story of Ken Killip. He was profoundly lost, and while the rational part of his brain remained convinced that he was getting close to Rock Lake, the emotional part was driving him on with more and more urgency. You know how it is, baby. Just fucking be ready for when your brain goes haywire. Fucking, uh, end it with some Alan Watts. <laughs> In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. Yeah, focus. Chapter 6. We're all going to die. These are some good stories up here. Two more. This one actually called, We're All Going to Fucking Die. I don't think YouTube would prefer that in the algorithm. In January of 1982, Steve Callahan, he set off for the Atlantic coast. He was alone in his boat, and he left from Portugal. He hit the Caribbean islands within a week, and in the islands, he got hit by a super fucking gale force wind. The night of, quote, he believes that he might have been struck by a whale. Whatever the cause, he shot out of bed at the sound of a loud noise. A rush of water exploded into the cabin. Before he could get to his knife, he was wasted deep in water and had to dive in total darkness to cut the lines of his survival bag. This is a nightmare. Being in a sinking boat in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> you need your equipment. He's thinking fast here. Lawrence detours the entire story. He's talking about a yacht that sank off the coast of France earlier that year. And one of the crewmates panicked. Among us, I'm not going to find the drop for that crewmate. <laughs> he panics. He's yelling, we're all going to fucking die. And this guy was right. They all died because of him. He inflated the life raft too early and it blew away in the wind. <laughs> 
<laughs> Imagine that moment of silence. Everyone looks at. Are you fucking serious? <laughs> We're all gonna fucking die. This experienced boatsman trying to set an Atlantic coast record has some more poise. Callahan is his name. He's a natural seaman. He's going to swim like a sperm. <laughs> so he made a couple like dives in with his knife between his neck, cutting free survival equipment. Lawrence says, survival starts before the accident. Callahan, a boat designer, built the 21-foot cruise ship himself and included a design sur survival watertight compartment. He prevents prolonged sinking. Just for the experience, he had once inflated the four-man life raft that the U.S. Coast Guard required on his boat. He climbed inside and thought it was too big. I'm ending the quote. He was saying, the life craft that they require, it's too big. I'm going to take a two-man life raft. <laughs> And this thing is going to become his torture chamber that he has to survive in adrift. This story is nowhere near as good as uh, Louis Zamparelli we got coming up. Survived 40 days on a life raft of the unbroken story. And then he goes to a Japanese prisoner of war camp. It's a wild one. It's worth a whole book. So this guy, he packed half of what he needed. Another one of those what-the-fuck decisions. Titanic. You probably want some more lifeboats. He was bringing up 75% of people freeze in catastrophe. Super relevant for this quote. Others maintain that people rarely panic, but others remain calm in denial. Ooh, so, yeah, you're expecting, yeah, these fucking idiots, when the asteroid hits, I'm going to drive out of town in my 4x4 car. That's not what happens. People don't panic. People actually remain calm. They get in denial. He continues this quote, As what happens in the World Trade Center, when the United States attacked Hiroshima and Nagasaki with atomic bombs, the Japanese noticed the same phenomena among their survivors. They named it Buddha Buddha, which means do nothing sickness. <laughs> this is terrifying. <laughs> Sound a little bit MFP. Mass formation psycho. People just go about their day like... The world isn't getting worse. There's a scene in Saving Private Ryan, you know, that all the men are just like wandering around looking for their severed arm. Keep on firing back. <laughs> he told a story about a guy at the World Trade Center who heard the impact, saw the smoke, and still went into his office. What? This guy is the employee of the year. What are you doing, my friend? Seriously. I mean, if the fucking fire index is a little bit high here at Boulder, I call it out of work. There's danger. I have higher than a 0.25% chance of death. I can't do anything. <laughs> what the heck, man? These people just continue and wander onto the 80th floor of the World Trade Center after the explosion. <laughs> Maybe that guy had other motives. Callahan, this guy was so well prepared for his boat crash. He started recanting stories of his head. He was reading a waterproof book he had. <laughs> it was uh, 117 Days Adrift, the name of the book. Quote, Callahan knew that a few castaways made it past a month, and he was doing the impossible. So he only wound up going a couple weeks. And that's on his part. He was prepared to survive. He warned people where he was going. When you're adrift at sea... He says, in a survival raft, within 24 hours, your skin succumbs to several hundred sores caused by salt water. <laughs> Callaghan, he, although he was turning into a human boil, he played survival games with himself. He's a high-level survival man. Go watch that show alone again. I'll plug it, because all they do is fucking make checkerboards. We got a cheesing, cheesy looking quote to end it here. I might need some background noise. Survival is a simple test. There's only one right answer, but cheating is allowed. And in the end, Steve Callahan passed. That was too much. <laughs> Chapter 7, our final one The Day of the Fall. I got a deep quote here to start this one. Last chapter of deep survival. 
to enter the wilderness, to challenge the forces of nature, we must be worthy. And worthiness doesn't come from a weekend survival school. The Eagle Scouts, or even a few years in the military, he's putting everyone down. Peter Leschenk wrote, In fire and other emergency operations, you must not merely tolerate uncertainty, you must savor it. Or you won't last long, the most efficient preparation is a general mental, physical, and professional readiness, nurtured over years of training and experience. You live to live. It's deeper, like he started the book. You live to live, it's in your fucking heart. You gotta make yourself a weapon, that firefighter is saying. You gotta train and just be experience. Lawrence got to interview that boat boy Callahan for the book. He asked him, you know, boil down your experience to one grand truth for us. You saw death. Callahan goes, never forget that you can't depend on anybody. You really have to want to survive. It has to be within yourself. It's all about fucking self-reliance in all of these stories at the end of the day. He gets emotional talking about needing to be worthy to be alive. <laughs> what the hell? Lawrence God Zalis? Who are you to say who is worthy to be alive? I'm getting stuffy drinking water here. <laughs> I try to do that so you don't have to hear it. Lawrence is like becoming the Pope for this last chapter. He's judging people's morality. He's doubling down on 9-11. <laughs> yeah. We need to talk about the most dangerous game because he's wasting the last chapter. It's a tale as old as time. How do you survive being hunted? It's a traditional motif you got out there in the woods. The rabbit and the panther. Why does the rabbit smoke his pipe all day if there's a cat as black as night, a panther stalking him? The rabbit knows he is smarter than the panther. As a human, you are the rabbit. You can beat any animal in the world at checkers. Now, if you make a spear, you could seriously defeat any animal. You just got to outsmart it. Find a crevice you could crawl into and the bear can't fit and stab it you know what i'm saying <laughs> i want to see they have uh, this thing in russia i read about it's called slapping the bear <laughs> children they have all kinds of crazy pets over there caracals you could own anything you want these children will go and slap animals in america at least we got our floridian boys wrestling gators that shit is badass baby Woo! I want to go to Gatorland. <laughs> I diagnose our country with do-nothing sickness. We are the people wandering into... Go out there and slap a fucking bear. They say, once a bear eats man, it turns into the most dangerous game. It gets the taste for man meat. And apparently this happens to humans too. It gives you prions in the brain. You get mad human sickness and you want to eat people... Zombies. <laughs> yeah, don't hunt each other. That's the lesson there. How do you survive the most dangerous game? Don't go to a private island. In the USA, you only got to worry about um, two kinds of bears. And barely. What? Am I making some unbearable puns? Uh... That was better than the time I tried to make the white bear, black bear joke. Black bear be like, let me get your honey. We got <laughs> Alaska is the only country that has a state Kodiak bears. And some of those are man eaters. Let's just be grateful out here, people. There's a, There used to be lions. You got to read American Serengeti. And be more grateful that you're still allowed to own a gun because you won't be allowed to protect yourself soon. How do any of these people, have they never been in the woods? <laughs> what the fuck? Lawrence, he gives us 10 tips of survival to end it. Step one, perceive. These Bear grills. I'm saying. You got to seek a plan to have a plan. Uh, step two, remain calm. You got to use humor to... Remain clear and use fear to focus yourself as well. Step three, think, analyze, plan, improvise, adapt. Chapter four, step four, 
Take correct, decisive action. Step five, celebrate success. Step six, be grateful you're alive. Step seven, play songs, uh, make up games. It's all mental. Step eight, see the beauty. Step nine, believe you will succeed. Step 10, surrender. Let go of the fear of dying. You got to replace that with action. Got a final quote here. No, some people would rather not see it. But the bull is there for all of us. Some of us choose the path, the cape in front of its horns. To live life is to risk it. And when you feel the rush of air and catch the stink of hot breath in your face, you enter the secret order of those who have seen their own death up close. Kind of a badass quote, bit over the top. Teddy Roosevelt put it better. He said, uh... Whoever dances in the ring with the bull the longest has lived the most. You're definitely going to step in some bull crap <laughs> when you're in the ring. That's life. So just prepare and get over those shite stains. Here's a fun fact for you guys to end it. The third guy who walked on the moon, Pete Conrad. Yeah, he's got a pretty forgettable name. He died in a motorcycle accident. He was on his way to the hospital. He was pronounced dead. Why did a man that experienced the exhilaration of going to the moon, he needed the adrenaline rush of a motorcycle every single day? See what I'm saying here? I would think that telling a girl that you've been to the moon is more of a selling point in the bedroom than, uh, yeah, I, can, uh, I can't afford a car. That's why I ride a motorcycle. <laughs> Conrad, Pete. The third guy, after Buzz and whoever the other hero is, he continued to ride because survival is the spice of life, baby. It's all about risk, he's saying, and you assess your own risk. Homie was in a tin can and he orbited the moon. He came home and he rode a motorcycle every day. You gotta update your fucking mental models, uh, your bookmarks, see some reasoning in your life to make a plan instead of staying comatose. And as the Gonzalez family knows, um, the other spice of life, it's adobo allspice. <laughs> Double soundboard to end it. That is Lawrence Gonzalez's Deep Survival, baby. <laughs> Thanks for sticking around, getting silly for this episode of Outdoors, which people seem to not like that much, but fuck it. We're having fun out here. Uh, next week on the show... It's another Patreon exclusive, so you YouTubers get subscribed up. Only a doll hair. A full hour and longer we usually go about C. Wright Mills, the power elite. Talking about classism, it's going to get elitist. Oh, let's go, that's class! That's right, baby. How does the other half live, the power elite? How do they maintain that lifestyle and pass it down for generations? C. Wright Mills is one of the best academics from the 1960s. This was before every fucking academic was cucked out. One of the most notable authors we'll have here in a long time. Classy age of journalism, baby. I'm excited for this one. Fully gift videos. You guys are getting it every single month along with memes and hikes and all the good stuff. YouTubers, get subscribed. Harry Schwant over on Instagram. I want to thank you guys one more time for coming out and being a fellow camper this week's edition. How about a random soundboard effect to take us out? That's me counting all my motherfucking YouTube revenue, baby. No mid-rolls ever. I'm the greatest host. Nick Munez signing off. Love you guys. See you next week. Peace.